Welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Hey, if you enjoy this podcast at all, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. I've got a couple different options in the link in the description, so go ahead and click the Patreon link, and you can support me for different uh, amounts per month. And if you support me for $5 a month, you get an awesome sticker. You get the joy of knowing that you've helped me buy more books to research more podcast episodes, and you get instant access to all the podcast episodes the day that I record them. So I could have a backlog of anywhere from like five to 15 episodes ready for you to listen to or watch uh, behind the paywall over at Patreon. If you're not like me and you have some degree of patience, then feel free to wait for the episodes to come out. I think I'm going to probably do one to three episodes per week. So uh, yeah, for you patient folks, feel free. But if you've enjoyed this podcast, consider becoming a, uh, a Patreon supporter. All right, enough, uh, enough prostituting myself out there. Um, today, we're going to ask the question, then hopefully try and answer the question, does God know what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog? Now, I know that uh, right off the bat here, it's got the ring of, you know, can, can a thousand uh, angels dance on the, the head of a pin or something like that? But I think once we get into it, you'll see that this is a really interesting problem. Can God know what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog? That has a lot of implications to it. You know, so initially we think God is omniscient. You know, classical theism believes that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent. You know, he, he exists everywhere in his creation, and he's omniscientia. He's all-knowing. He's omniscient. So if God knows everything, it would seem that God knows what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog. But that what it's likeness is weird. It's not just like a proposition about something. God knows what a Chicago-style hot dog is, obviously. But does he know what it's like experientially to taste a Chicago-style hot dog? And what would that even mean for God? God knows everything. Okay, yeah, I agree with that. He should probably know what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog. But what does that mean for God? Like, would he have to gain that experience once the Chicago-style hot dog is invented? Once all those ingredients are finally put together to make it a classical, you know, Chicago-style hot dog, the best ever, a Gene and Jude's hot dog, or a uh, Steve's Euro hot dog from Lombard, Illinois, or a Dick Portello's hot dog over there uh, on the corner there? (laughs) Does he have to wait in order to experience it? How is it that God could have this experiential knowledge of of knowing what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog? There's a lot of different types of hot dogs and like what's the quintessential hot dog? Does does he know what it's like to taste anyone, the archetypal Chicago style hot dog, all the ingredients? What are we even talking about here? If it's the case that God had to wait uh, for Chicago style hot dogs to be invented in order to taste one, then it seems like there was an aspect of knowledge that God didn't have before that thing was invented. And I don't think we want to admit that. So it seems like, you know, before God invented the world, he would know what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog. But eating and experiencing that kind of experience, that's that's an aspect of being an incarnate being, being a physical being with taste buds and taste receptors and tongues and preferences and all different types of experiences like that. God is spirit. We're spirit and we're physical as well, but God's spirit. He, He doesn't have taste buds. Right? So he, he incarnated himself in the person of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ was a first century Jew. He, he wouldn't eat a pork product. So even if Chicago style hot dogs did exist in the first century, he wouldn't have eaten one. So we can't use the incarnate Christ and his human knowledge that he experienced uh, through the hypostatic union. That is the union of the divine nature and the human nature. We can't use that to say, yeah, you know, we can extrapolate out that God knows what it's like to eat a Chicago style hot dog. Because him being a good first century Jew would not have done that and wouldn't know what it's like to eat pork products. Okay, so we, we don't get to just use that kind of shortcut there. Also, if if God had to incarnate himself in order to eat this hot dog, then it, it seems like he didn't know that experience beforehand, and then he came to know it. And I'm really uncomfortable with God coming to know something. I think that messes with our conception of God being perfect. You know, if he's perfect, then he can't change, because any change would be to be imperfect. He changed from perfect to more perfect? That doesn't make sense. No, if, he, if there's a change in a perfect being, it's a change from greater to worse, 
from perfect to imperfect. And if he is perfect, then it seems like he shouldn't be able to change at all. So I don't think that's the answer either. So how are we going to answer this? How can we answer the question, does God know what it's like to eat a Chicago style hot dog? And why do I keep talking about Chicago style hot dogs? Aren't there other different types? Well, I'm a good uh, Chicagoland boy. I grew up around here and that's the best hot dog. You don't put ketchup on it. And no, I don't know all the ingredients. I know I just go over there to to Dick Portello's and ask for a hot dog all the way. And if he puts ketchup on it, I'm going to lose my mind because ketchup doesn't go on hot dogs. But all the other good stuff, you just ask for it all the way and you get a Chicago style hot dog. It's the best, especially if it's Vienna beef. I don't know if Portello's uses that, but every other uh, Chicagoland area hot dog place is going to use the best hot dogs Vienna beef. So that's the kind of hot dog God would eat if God could eat hot dogs. But more importantly, let's let's get down to some more philosophical stuff here. The kind of knowledge we're talking about is knowledge of qualia experiences. The the what it's likeness. So not just propositional knowing that and not not just like knowing how. So you may know how to ride a bike, but you don't know all the propositions that go into riding a bike. So knowing Know that, know that knowledge is knowing about facts, knowing that, knowing propositions. You actually, you can know all the propositions about riding a bike, but you don't have any experiential knowledge of riding a bike. You don't have any know-how knowledge of riding a bike. So you know all the facts of what to do, to pedal, to balance, but then you try to do it and you you can't do it because you don't know how. So there's know that knowledge, there's know-how knowledge, and there's another kind of experiential knowledge, which is hard for me to wrap my mind around, but it's like know whom knowledge. So you could know every stat about LeBron James. But then you call up LeBron James and you say, hey, do you know Parker said a case? And he goes, no, I don't know him. So like I, I may know all the facts about him, but I don't know him. So there's at least these three kind of types of knowledge. And I'm not super sure where qualia experiences fit into here. And some people think that, you know, qualia is just a nonsense term anyways. But let's let's define qualia. What is qualia? Qualia is that what it's likeness, that qualitative experience uh, that first person subjects have when they're consciously experiencing things, when they're awake. So when you eat a strawberry, you have this qualia experience of tasting a strawberry. There's something that it's like to eat a strawberry. Moreover, there's something that it's like to be you, which is different than the something that it's like to be me, which is different than what it's like to be a bat. Thomas Nagel, one of my favorite philosophers, he he uses this actual argument of what it's like to be a bat to show that there's this first person perspective that subjects have, which cannot be eliminated out. There's something like, there's something that it's like to be you, and you can't reduce that away to just matter in motion. So what is qualia? Well, qualia is what you taste. It's what you smell. It's what you touch. It's what you feel. It's it's what you're doing right now. You're having a qualia experience. There's something that it's like to listen to a Parker's Pensies podcast episode, and that something is super awesome. So you're having a great qualia experience right now. These are ubiquitous in all of our waking moments and many of our non-waking moments when we're asleep and we're dreaming. When you eat an apple, when you stub your toe, when you're annoyed uh, with your, your podcast host who just keeps on going on and on and on about Chicago-style hot dogs... There's something that it's like to be in that state, that phenomenological state. There's something that it's like to have qualia experiences. Right now, you're you're having one. One philosopher has even proclaimed that qualia are what make life worth living. Is there any way that we can get a little bit more precise on this? I think maybe. Let's turn to to J.P. Moreland. He provides a succinct definition by saying a quale or the plural form qualia, is a specific sort of intrinsically characterized mental state, such as seeing red, having a sour taste, feeling a pain. So qualia have to do with the qualitative experience of our mental states. Many philosophers more specifically link qualia to conscious states. As John Searle explains, there's a special qualitative feel to each type of conscious state, and we are not in agreement about how to fit these subjective feelings into our overall view of the world as consisting of objective reality. Such states and events are sometimes called qualia, and the problem of accounting for them within our overall worldview is called the problem of qualia. So we'll return back to this problem of qualia um, a little bit maybe in this podcast, but definitely again in a different podcast. But let's get straight on what, what consciousness means. According to Searle, consciousness refers to those states of sentience and awareness that are typically begun when we awake from a dreamless sleep 
and continue until we go to sleep again, or fall into a coma, or die, or otherwise become unconscious. So for Searle, qualia and consciousness are coextensive. Like to be conscious is to experience qualia or have these different qualies coming in and out of our, our phenomenal consciousness. Searle says, but to the extent that you are talking about qualia, I think that the term qualia is misleading because it suggests that the quality of a state of consciousness might be carved out from the rest of the consciousness and set on one side, as if you could talk about the rest of the problem of consciousness while ignoring the subjective, qualitative feel of consciousness. But you can't set qualia on one side because if you do, there is no consciousness left over. So we see that the qualia and consciousness for Searle are coextensive. Now, David Chalmers also intimately unites qualia and consciousness, but adds a third aspect into the mix to further elucidate qualitative conscious states. He talks about the something that is likeness, which uh, again borrows from Thomas Nagel, who wrote his most influential piece uh, in the philosophy of mind and qualia discussion called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Chalmers explains when we perceive think and act, there is a whir of causation and information processing. But this processing does not usually go on in the dark. There is also an internal aspect. There is something it feels like to be a cognitive agent. This internal aspect is conscious experience. Conscious experiences ranges from v uh, vivid color sensations to experiences of the faintest background aromas from hard-edged pains to the elusive experience of thoughts on the tip of one's tongue, from mundane sounds and smells to the encompassing grandeur of musical experience, from the triviality of a nagging itch to the weight of a deep existential angst, from the specificity of the taste of a peppermint to the generality of one's experience of selfhood. All these have a distinct experienced quality. All are prominent parts of the inner life of the mind. We can say that a being is conscious if there is something it is like to be that being, to use a phrase made famous by Thomas Nagel. Similarly, a mental state is conscious if there is something it is like to be in that mental state. To put it another way, we can say that a mental state is conscious if it has a qualitative feel, an associated quality of experience. Their qualitative feels are also known as phenomenal qualities, or qualia for short. The problem of explaining these phenomenal qualities is just a problem of explaining consciousness. So as Chalmers explains, and as many other philosophers agree, to speak of something having a, quali a qualia experience is to say, with Thomas Nagel, that there's something it's like to be in that conscious state, to be that conscious being. Nagel's Something It Is Like was originally introduced in his now canonical essay, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, in which he argued that we can all know about bats' behavior and physiology, but nothing about the qualitative character of their experiences. An ideally complete neurophysiology, cognitive science, and behavioral psychology of bats will tell us nothing about the phenomenology of bats' experience. Nagel used bats as an example because they are similar enough for us to reasonably infer or assume that there is, in fact, something it is like to be a bat, but they are dissimilar enough to demonstrate his point. What could it possibly be like to see the world and navigate through echolocation? Jaguan Kim explains that Nagel's term, what is it like, has become a widely used, almost standard way of explaining what it is for a state to be a conscious state, or to be more exact, phenomenally conscious state. So this is still a live debate in the philosophy of mind whether qualia exists at all, whether you can scoop out and, and uh, abstract out different qualies from the, the broad phenomenal consciousness uh, of the unified experience? Are qualia just synonymous with consciousness? Is conscious experience made up of different qualia experiences? We're not going to settle that debate here, but all this to say that eating a Chicago-style hot dog is a qualia experience. There's something that it's like to do that. And if I went from not knowing what that tastes like to knowing what it tastes like, then God should know that difference in my phenomenal consciousness, in my state of uh, knowledge. If I went from not knowing what it tastes like to knowing what, it's, what it tastes like, God should know that. So God should know what it's like for me to taste a Chicago-style hot dog. And I think probably God should know what it would be like for him to eat or to taste a Chicago-style hot dog. But now I'm attributing qualia experience to God who doesn't have the same kind of sense organs that I do. So I think uh, if we can go to Frank Jackson... 
uh, another f uh, philosopher of mind, he gives this scenario which might help us think through this problem. He gives this scenario, this thought experiment, this uh, intuition pump to, to think through whether or not qualia experience constitutes knowledge. So um, in his famous essay, What Mary Didn't Know, which itself is a, a play on words, uh, a play on the, the song, you know, Mary, did you know? Right. So this is what Mary didn't know. So in this scenario, Mary is a woman who's locked in a room. And it's a black and white room, and in some scenarios, they, they paint her, her hands white so that she only can see in black and white. Everything in the room is black and white, all the computer screens, all the books, even her own skin is, is actual white. So she's never had a, a color experience, but she's studied color. She studied everything about color. She studied all the hues. She's, she studied all the uh, refractions and reflections and, and anything you can know propositionally about color she knows it she knows that apples are red she just hasn't ever seen the actual color red before so she has all the facts all the data it's a it's an intuition pump kind of thing so just go with it that she could know everything about color without actually seeing color and then one day these crazy scientists whoever locked mary in the room they open up the door and they let her go outside and she sees a red apple she already knew it was red so that that's not a surprise to her she didn't learn a new fact but she actually saw the color red in this apple. So the question is, did Mary learn something? Like, to me, I think it's so obvious that she did. She learned what it's like to see red or to be appeared to redly. Because this is a whole question about color, whether color is like an objective thing outside or if it's just the way that our eyes see things. And that's an interesting point. We can get into that. Maybe we'll do a whole podcast on that. But she's at least being appeared to redly, where she's never been appeared to redly before. Nothing has appeared red to her before. So it seems like now she's learned, oh yeah, that's that's red. And now I look up at the sky, that's blue. It seems like that qualia experience, that qualia uh, data that she's experiencing is knowledge. Now she's gained some knowledge. So this is really hotly debated. People go back and forth on this, but Frank Jackson uses it to show that naturalism is false or a naturalistic, physicalistic uh, interpretation of the philosophy of mind is false. And I love that. I, I don't know enough to, to go into that right now. We can do another episode on that. Man, I'm making all these kind of promises to you guys. I better back them up. So anyways, she went from this not knowing this quali qualitative qualia experience of colors to coming to know them. And just like the hot dog scenario, you know, if I went from not knowing what it's like to knowing what it's like to eat a Chicago style hot dog, so Mary went from not knowing what red is to knowing what red is. And God, if he's omniscient, if he knows all things, he should know that difference in our own qualitative uh, phenomenal consciousness. He should know the difference. But can he know that difference? Well, why is that even a problem? Like, well, who cares? Because it seems like we've shifted the question from, does God know what it's like to eat a hot dog? To Does God know what it's like for me to eat a hot dog? And both questions are, they, I admit they are different, but they're really closely related. Because it seems like in order to know what it's like for me to eat a hot dog or for me to experience the color red, you'd have to be me. Because that, quali that qualia experience is mine. So in order to know that qualia experience, you'd have to be me, it seems like. So God's not me. So it seems like there are things that God doesn't know, and that might mess with our idea of omniscience, if omniscience means God knows everything there is to know. So maybe you can just cut down and pair, pair off uh, a little bit of omniscience. God God knows everything there is to know, but he can't know subjective states of uh, individual you know, subjects. He can't know my states unless he were me, and he's not me, so he can't know that. No problem. We just cut that off of our definition. Other people would say, well, omniscience is just knowing all true propositions, and God knows all true propositions, and so he doesn't need to know qualia experiences, if there are any qualia experiences, which, you know, again, I think it's so obvious that there are. It's the first person subjective experience you can't deny. To deny it, I think, is self-defeating, because you're a self-conscious first-person perspective denying that you're a self-conscious first-person perspective. Anyways, that's the problem. How could God know what's going on in my first person perspective if he's not me? But if he's not me, then we have to reformulate our view of omniscience. But not so fast. There's this philosopher theologian, Linda Zagzebski, and she says that God does know everyone's perspective. And she calls this omni-subjectivity. All like subjectivity, right? So 
God knows my perspective. He knows what it's like to be a bat. He knows what it's like to be the squirrels outside. always wrestling each other when I'm trying to study Greek. He knows what it's like to be an ant. He knows every perspective there is to know. But that's weird. You know, how, how does God know that kind of stuff? Well, Zagzebski, Zagzebski goes in on a, a pretty intricate and detailed account of her omnisubjectivity. Zagzebski says, if an omniscient being has perfect epistemic states, then an omniscient being should have omnisubjectivity. An omniscient being would have to have the deepest grasp, grasp of every object of knowledge, including the conscious states of every creature. So Zagzebski doesn't want to just cut off different pieces of our definition of omniscience. She just says, yeah, I, I agree that God should know subjective states of all um, conscious beings. And so he does. She says that omnisubjectivity does not require identity with every conscious being, though. She goes on to say, but since no one can know what it's like to be in a conscious state without adopting that conscious state themselves, at least in an imagination, God must be able to adopt Mary's mental states, at least in imagination. And here again, she's referring to Frank Jackson's essay about Mary the color specialist. She then goes on to explain that there's a difference between first person knowledge and third person knowledge. So if Zagzebski is... Uh, walking in Walmart and is a bunch of milk is spilling out of her cart. She could look back and go, oh man, I am making an embarrassment of myself and all these people think that I'm stupid. That's that's her using the, the first person indexical I. But she could also have the come to the understanding that Linda Zagzebski is uh, making a fool of herself. That's the third person understanding. That's That's what everyone else could think too. That's an objective state. I could think that about her. Her husband could think that about her. God could think that about her. But it doesn't make sense for me to put myself in the first person in school and say, I am experiencing that. No, I'm not experiencing that. She is. I can see it objectively, propositionally from a, from a third person perspective, but I don't see it the way she does from the first person. Zagzebski is arguing that God must be able to see both. He must be omnisubjectival. And so she wants to say that empathy is the tool by which God can come to know the subjective experiences of subjects. So in, o in order to experience someone else's emotional states, their qualitative experience, we can use empathy in order to relate to them, to understand where they're coming from. So she goes on to say that total empathy is this tool that God has, where he can understand all the states that a person is in and Therefore, he can represent the states that they're in fully, especially if he has perfect total empathy. And if perfect total empathy includes a complete and accurate representation of another person's emotions, perfect total empathy includes a complete and accurate representation of all of another person's conscious states. So by using this tool of empathy, God, who is omniscient, can come to know what it's like for me to be embarrassed or for Linda to be embarrassed for spilling milk or for me to eat a... Chicago style hot dog. And then by, uh, you know, extension, he would know what it's like for himself to eat a Chicago style hot dog. So Zagzebski thinks that empathy is this tool that leads God to this omnisubjectival knowledge where he knows the, per the qualitative experience of every subject or at least every conscious being, because maybe, maybe uh, a conscious being like an ant or if they're not conscious, a bat, then maybe that a bat's not a subject, but it's at least conscious. So God knows what it's like to be a bat as well. Zegzebski says, I propose that an omniscient being must have perfect total empathy with you and with all conscious beings. This is the property I call omnisubjectivity. An omnisubjective being would know what it is like to be you as well as what it is like to be your dog. The bats in the cave, the birds, the fish, the reptiles, and each human being yet to be born. An omnisubjective being would know everything you know or understand from living your life. That's interesting. You know, I, I'm, I'm tempted to agree with her, but it, it might mean that God is taking in information that he's learning. I don't like that. You know, does does God have to wait until, until Parker Sedeckes is born and then eats a Chicago-style hot dog in order to empathize with me, even totally or omnisciently or perfectly empathize with me in order to derive that experience from my own experience? in order to empathize that into his own knowledge? I don't think so. Maybe that's not what she's saying. But it seems to me like this is not a classical understanding of, of God's knowledge. 
Classically, guys like Aquinas have said that God has knowledge of understanding and knowledge of vision. Knowledge of understanding being intellectual understanding of what is possible, and then knowledge of vision being awareness of reality. Today we, we talk about necessary knowledge and free knowledge. God's knowledge is, is derived in two different ways, and it's, it's not really even derived, it's immediately his. He knows what's possible, and then he knows what he's chosen to actuate. So he knows that Square circles are impossible because it's, you know, conceptually absurd and it goes against his nature, I would say. So he, he knows that there's no, he doesn't have to look into creation to see if there's ever going to be a square circle. He knows it's not possible for him to do that because it'd be a contradiction of his own nature and he can't do that and won't do that. So he doesn't. But he also has this free knowledge, what he's chosen to make. So God could have made a unicorn. Like he could have actuated a world where there are unicorns, where they can fly, where they have horns, but he's chosen to not do that kind of world. But to actuate a world in, in which we talk about them and they're conceptually real or whatever in our ideas, but they're not actually real. They don't have any real existence out in the world. So that's, God knows that by his free knowledge because he knows himself, he knows his plan, he knows what he's chosen to create. He knows what's possible and he knows what is actual because he has this kind of knowledge. Just, he that's what it means to be God, to have this kind of necessary knowledge and free knowledge. Now, some theologians have come along and said that God has this middle knowledge, too, that he knows counterfactual truths. And other theologians say those counterfactual truths are just in the other two forms of knowledge. And so there's this whole debate, and Molinism gets brought in. And we're not talking about that today. Again, I'll make another promise. We can talk about that in the future. But classically, that's the understanding that that's the understanding of God's knowledge. God doesn't take in knowledge. God doesn't have to go look through the corridors of time to see what's going to happen in order to know what's going to happen. He knows what's possible and he knows what's actual because he's planned it. You know, God has decreed what will come to pass. He doesn't have to take in knowledge. And so I think maybe this omnisubjectival understanding would have God gaining knowledge. And again, like we said before, if he's changing, then this perfect being is becoming less perfect or is becoming more perfect. Whatever it is, that that seems like a problem for me. So I'm a little bit uh, wary of... Linda Zegzebski's uh, conception of omnisubjectivity. Man, her name is really hard for me to pronounce. Linda Zagzebski. Boom. Okay. That alone should be worth becoming a Patreon supporter. But if we are going to reject her position, her omnisubjectivity, and again, I could be interpreting it wrong. Maybe it's maybe that's the position we should hold. But if it if it leads to God changing or coming to know something he didn't know before, I think we should probably reject it. What do we do then? Maybe we go with uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein's understanding of, or rejection of, a private language. There's this idea of a beetle in a box. If I have a, a box and it has a beetle in it, and you have a beetle in your box, and everyone in the world has a beetle inside of their box, but none of us can look inside each other's boxes. We all can look down at our own beetle in our own box, but I can't look at your beetle in your box then how the heck do I know what you're talking about? Like, how do I know if your beetle corresponds to my beetle? What, if what you mean by beetle is the same as what I mean by beetle? And so some people will uh, use this to critique private knowledge or, or direct access to our own conscious states. And so, you know, there is no private language because in order to have a private language, uh, the, the concepts themselves completely drop out because it's like everyone having their own beetle that no one can look at it or represent. So there's no such thing as a private language. So so maybe uh, because pain is something that, that makes sense for you and for me and you don't have your own type of pain and I have my own type of pain, then maybe God can know what it's like for us to be in pain or for us to have a, a qualia experience of a Chicago style hot dog, which means God could know what it's like for me to have that qualia experience. But what about for God to have that qualia experience of eating a Chicago style hot dog? Like, again, he doesn't have taste buds and stuff like that. Well, he would know what it's like if he were to incarnate today and eat a Chicago style hot dog. So so maybe that's that's what we do. God has just such comprehensive propositional knowledge that he could put all that together and know what it would be like to be in different qualia states. And maybe he doesn't even need to put it together. It's just like direct awareness for a God who's omniscient like that. And so though he doesn't have direct awareness of it, though he doesn't have experience, experiential knowledge of it, his knowledge is so comprehensive that he actually doesn't need to have 
experiential knowledge of it. I think that I think this is probably the answer. I think that probably because God has designed us and designed our taste buds to function in such a way when the delicious, delicious Chicago-style hot dog hits our tongues, I think that he has a better knowledge of that qualia experience for us than we do. Because he's the designer of it, because there's teleology, because there's telos, his purpose, this goal, because he's the one who has directed that, because he's the one who has created us to enjoy food i think that probably he knows well not probably I th- he's omniscient dude I-, I think that he knows what it's like and what it would be like for us and what it would be like for him to have that qualitative experience if he were that kind of creature or if he took on flesh again incarnated himself was walking in the flesh and had a chicago style hot dog so i think with that like conditional knowledge i know I- if i were to be in this situation i think that that puts him in this place where he does know what it's like to eat a Chicago style hot dog. But again, I I don't know because I think about Mary and Mary knew all the facts about color, but she never actually experienced color. And I think she learned something new when she did first see the red apple. So this would be maybe analogous to God knowing all the propositional facts about taste buds and receptors and, uh, and hot dogs and pickles and peppers and relish. Like, I, I think that maybe we're still in the same spot. Maybe we haven't moved past this. But but I think that a simple little uh, analogy can help us understand how God can know our first-person qualia, qualitative, uh, phenomenal consciousness experiences without himself being us, without himself learning from us or empathizing with us and then coming to have that knowledge. I think that a a quick little analogy might help. And I took this from one of the guys that I disciple, a mentor, for those who don't know what discipling is. I was driving him home from a a ministry event and I was telling him about my paper, Qualia Assurance, which I thought was just a a fantastic name. It's all about Christianity, you know, Christian theology and and Qualia. And uh, I think the subtitle was like, there's something that it's like to think about Christian theology, something like that. It was was great. And I was telling him about Qualia experiences and he goes, yeah, man, that's just like... uh, how you know what it's like to, to lick stuff. And I was like, dude, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And he's like, well, think about that steering wheel. You know what it would be like to lick that, even though you've never licked it. And I look at it, I see the texture, and I realize that he's right. And I look around all over the car, I see the dusty dashboard, and I'm like, I know what it would be like if I were to lick that. And I looked outside at the rough bark on the trees, and I thought, yeah, I, I know what it would be like to lick that. And I just thought about leaves and birds and all grass, dirt. Like, I know what it would be like to lick that stuff. And I think those experiences, my uh, understanding of what it would be like to lick stuff, different things that I've never licked before, it comes from my past experience of licking stuff. I think that's probably true. So in God's case, if we make this analogical to God's knowledge, God doesn't know by uh, experience. He just knows by his necessary knowledge and his free knowledge. But I think his knowledge of our personal subjective states, our qualia states, is similar. It's, It's analogous to the way that we know what things would, what texture things would be like if we were to lick them. So I've never licked this book in front of me, but I, I know what it would be like to lick that. And, and you know what? I could probably be wrong. I think I could be wrong about that. I think I have a really good understanding but I could be wrong. God, on the other hand, who's omniscient, couldn't be wrong about it. And so I think just as we would know what it's like to lick something we've never licked, so God could know what it's like to eat a Chicago-style hot dog, though he's never incarnated himself and eaten one. Uh, and I think he would know that prior to. I think he'd know that a priori. I think he'd know that based on his his necessary and his free knowledge. I'm not sure which ones. Don't ask me. I think that's probably my answer. I, I, I like Zegzebski, but... Uh, if her position makes us believe that God learned something, then no, it's out. If not, then cool. I, I'll, I'm willing to explore that more, for sure. But I think that this uh, this licking analogy and, and the propositional understanding that he made all things, he made taste buds, he made tongues, Like, I think that that knowledge is so different than ours. I think it's original and ours is created, right? Uh, ours is derivative, his is original, his is analytic, ours is synthetic. Uh, I think because his knowledge is quantitatively different, like he knows way more, and because it's qualitatively different, that he knows as originator, he knows as creator and sustainer, his knowledge is different than ours. 
And I think it's analogous to ours, but there's disanalogy there. And so I think that he can know our qualitative states, though he's not us and though he's not had our experiences because he's the creator of us who has these experiences. And because he's decreed us to have these experiences, I think that just like we can know what it's like to go outside and lick the park bench, so God knows what it's like to eat a Chicago style hot dog. If you disagree, let me know. Comment, whatever, get a hold of me. Let me know how you answer this question. We could talk about this way more and, and perhaps someday we will, but that's gonna have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies and as always, all glory to God.